Hey friends, okay, so the purpose of this little lecture is to uh, give you some things to think about after you've already read the intro and act one of Ibsen's A Dollhouse. So hopefully you already read that. If you haven't, go ahead and stop this, go back, read the intro and act one, do the quiz on act one, then come and listen to this lecture and think more about the play. All right. So if you're ready, let's uh, let's jump into it. Uh, as I said, the play premiered in December 1879. So that just just a reminder of where we are on the big timeline of history. We're getting to the end of the 19th century. Right. Um, we talked about the heredity and environment ideas of Darwin and Freud, which are popular in the period. You have a sense of sort of what society was like in the late 19th century, uh, especially in, in Western Europe. We have a lot of industrialization. We have a lot of urbanization. With that is coming some social ills uh, that often accompany dense population. Um, we're also having an awareness of those social ills through progressive movements, through publications. Um, there's a lot of discussion about things like the poor, um, the economic system, uh, the righteousness of various kinds of modes of production, the place of women in society, uh, the rights of children. Many things are, are pushed forward because of where we are in history, because of scientific thought, because of industrialization. All right, so late 19th century, hop in time in the Western world. Now, I want you to think of realism in drama as a direct response to melodrama. Secretly, this is why we spent so much time talking about melodrama. I mean, A, I like melodrama. Melodrama is really interesting. Melodrama is still with us. You have to know about melodrama. But B, melodrama, understanding melodrama allows us to understand realism. In the 19th century, your general diet of theater entertainment was like 80% melodrama. Melodrama was so popular, it was ubiquitous. And so the realistic writers are in a period and in an industry drenched, steeped in melodrama. So when they wrote their plays, the realists, Ibsen, Shaw, Chekhov, Strindberg, others, when they wrote their plays, they are responding to melodrama. Um, we're not imposing that ahistorically on them. They really were responding to the dominance of melodrama. Well. Okay, what's so wrong with melodrama, you might ask? Well, uh, I think you have a lot of answers for that. But what would they have said was so wrong with melodrama? Why did you need to come up with some new drama to counter or respond to melodrama? Here's just a few things that would have bothered writers like Ibsen, Shostrinberg, Chekhov, and their friends and their intellectually par intellectual partners in the late 19th century. It's predictable, they would have said. Well, you said that about melodrama too, right? Sometimes we really, really enjoy the predictability of melodrama. It's comfort food entertainment, right? But if you're a hopping young writer with a fire in your belly, the predictability of melodrama is a problem, right? It's tidy, isn't it? Melodrama ties up all the loose ends at the end. Melodrama says that all effects have causes that you can easily identify and see coming. That's really a neat, tidy, orderly way to think about life. And these writers with their fire in their belly, they were not looking at life um, and seeing that to be accurate. So they had a problem with it. If for that reason, melodrama is safe, isn't it? I mean, that's why we seek melodrama when we want it. We want the safety. We're looking for something comfortable and safe. But for these writers, that safety was an issue. Um, they were not artistically or personally motivated by safe art. It's also non-revolutionary, right? We talked about that. The, it's, uh, melodrama supports the status quo. Melodrama is not revolutionary in tone. Melodrama says the existing structures of how women are treated, minorities are treated, how the economic system runs, they're fine. Don't worry, everything's okay, right? And that's a problem. That's what melodrama communicates, and that's a problem if you are 
a young person writing, or a person of any age, writing in the late 19th century who sees that there are issues with the status quo. You don't want art that's non-revolutionary. You want art that's a little bit revolutionary. You want art that causes a little trouble, right? For all of these reasons, melodrama was seen by these writers as art that avoided telling the truth. Art that gave audiences something much easier than the truth, truth to handle. And these writers wanted to do more and better with their drama, with their theater, than the comfort, safety, and status quo supporting tone of melodrama. That's where realism comes from, a response to these aspects of melodrama. So what do the realists want to do instead? Well, they want to show the world on stage as it really is experienced off stage. Yes, that involves real stuff on stage, sure. Yes, it involves, you know, teacups and real uh, materials and all that. But it's not just the real stuff on stage, right? That's what we talked about before. They wanted the world on stage to be like the world off stage in ways that are deeper than the real stuff. They wanna, wanted to avoid stock characters because they're easy, right? They want, wanted to avoid plot devices that don't really measure up to what lived experience is like. I don't know about you, but none of my problems have ever been solved by finding the other half of a locket just in the nick of time, right? Um, you can't actually decide everything you need to know about a person based on how much they look like a stock character that you've seen before. It's tempting. That's what stereotyping is, but it actually is, you know, flawed deeply. Um, so the realist writers wanted to avoid stock characterizations. They wanted to avoid familiar plot devices because it wasn't true to lived experience. They wanted to use the stage to explore real social issues and problems. I can't emphasize this enough. For the realistic writers, the realism was about social problems. They weren't just trying to capture dialogue the way they heard it, uh, you know, in a kitchen and put it on stage so that aesthetically it would be more actual. I mean, they liked that. But that wasn't their motivation. Their motivation was political and social. They wanted to explore problems. What are some problems they would want to explore? Well, poverty, um, illness, the plight of women, the plight of the oppressed, um, flaws in how society functions. They wanted to challenge the dominance of the power structures. That included uh, government, finances, religion. Uh, educational assumptions. They really wanted to uh, shed light on things that were being um, ignored, avoided, overlooked for reasons of comfort. Uh, they wanted to do better than that. That's why they didn't like melodrama, right? You get it? For all these reasons, they did not shy away from dark subject matter. Um, it's harder for us to appreciate this, okay? Because when we read the plays of Ibsen, Shaw, Strindberg, Chekhov, we don't see them as dirty or um, overly dark. Our entertainment has progressively embraced dark things so that our sensibilities of what is dark subject matter are really our own time period and, and hard to impose on other time periods, right? But think about the fact that uh, playwrights like Ibsen and Strindberg in particular uh, put um, sexually transmitted diseases in the plots of their plays. Nobody was doing anything like that. Like that was seen as uh, vulgar. Um, Ibsen's play Ghosts hinges on, the plot of it hinges on um, this question of sexually transmitted disease. One of the characters has um, syphilis, but he got it from his father having had syphilis when he was when the when the boy was conceived out of wedlock with um uh, the maid of the household it's a very convoluted plot so it also involves uh extramarital affairs and adultery and all kinds of stuff the the young man now has syphilis is going blind but he doesn't really understand how he got this because everybody tells stories that his father was a really good guy and only his mother knows that his father who's dead now wasn't a good guy. So the syphilis sort of 
sheds truth on, on how rotten his dad really was. And so his dad is like this ghost haunting the play, metaphorically. That's why it's called Ghosts. And he's in um, uh, love with the young man who's, got, who's going blind, is in love with a, a young woman. Well, it turns out that, ready for this, she is his half-sister, right? Because of who the father had an affair with. So he's in love with his half-sister, and uh, that gets sort of like understood by the mother character, and she's, you know, struggling with this. So we have basically an incestuous love between these two people, the, the young man is going blind and the girl he loves. We have the past history of adultery. We have sexually transmitted disease. We have this guy who's going blind and at the end of the play is so sure that he's, he's lost all hope that he asks his mother to, to please help him commit suicide and she agrees to do it. That's a lot of dark subject matter, right? I mean, that's pretty dark. And for 1883 or something like that, whenever Ghost came out, it's vulgar. It was seen as um, inappropriate. In fact, people at the time said that play, Ghosts, was, this is a quote that a critic, a newspaper critic at the time said, was an open sewer on the stage. How's that for some mental uh, imagery, right? So they did not shy away from dark subject matter. Even when we don't think the subject matter is that dark, they were not shying away from dark subject matter. So think about what is the dark subject matter in a dollhouse, right? All that to say, last bullet point on this slide, that the realist writers wanted to tell the truth about the human condition as they understood it, as they believed it to be true, as they wished to discuss it, right? I mean, it's all relative. P.S., speaking of telling the truth about the human condition, all that stuff I just said about ghosts and about the venereal disease, the sexually transmitted disease, and the syphilis. You don't actually get syphilis as a man because your father had it when you were conceived. It doesn't work that way, but they thought it worked that way in the late 19th century. So uh, Ibsen writes it into the play Ghosts because he thinks that's true. Um, uh, he doesn't know that it's scientifically false. So there's also, when I say they, they tell the truth the way they, as far as they understand it, there's medical science that's wrong in these realistic plays. But they thought it was true and, and they wrote it in there. In fact, in a dollhouse, it's, it's, it's sort of implied, and so you may don't really catch it, but Dr. Rank is sick and dying, not because he has done bad stuff. He's got a, he's got a sexually transmitted disease that's killing him. Um, but it's not because he's done anything bad because his father did. There's like a line kind of said about this. And then the period, people would have understood that. Um, it kind of flies over our heads a little bit. So realism. Solve the world. Talk about nasty things. Use real stuff, but also real problems. Don't shy away from the truth, okay? So not melodrama.